like meet. Well, well, sort of, sort of, yeah, virtually anyway. Maybe we'll, yeah. we hopefully get to do it in real life. I was kind of, you know, I went to the uh, uh, low carb. Zach and I were both at this low carb San Diego. He came to speak, and I just came to hang out because I live not far from there. It was fun, sort of running into just these various people that I've met online, and and so it was a. It was, a, it was a very, I'm glad I did it. It was a lot of fun. I spent two yeah. days hanging. I think I talked continuously <laughs> for two <laughs> days. So was, maybe, maybe next year they'll have you to speak. I mean, yeah, I feel like they, is, Yeah, I think there's some of that stuff. You know, there's something okay. that I'm excited about. I just got invited to speak at the U.S. Cattlemen's Association, which I think nice. is. Oh, sweet. I think that is, uh, you know, something that we have to liaise between, uh, you know, the people who produce our food and the consumers and, and this nutritional thing. I, I think they're... You know they've got such a they've been beaten up in the in the uh, you know they're they need a PR you know improve they need some easy improve their PR because they've been taking it on the chin for decades and they just I, I think they have to they have to do a better job and I'm going to talk to them about that so. I, I totally agree the the cattlemen the ranchers the dairy producers all the people that produce animal food I mean we need to stand up for them now we we needed to do it all along but now's the time to really step up well and that's and I think that's a thing you know I think a lot of are, are getting better in the the in the health advocacy space we're learning more we're we're becoming you know vocal proponents of that you know learning a bit the a little bit of the uh, Health science, but I think you know equally. I think you have to you have to take on all these aspects. You have to learn about you know environmental impact, and you learn about how your food is produced, and really understand it, and not just because most of the people, quite honestly, and this is and I'll and I'll credit the folks that, that, that unfortunately make these these sort of somewhat distorted propaganda type films. Is most of us think that animal agriculture is what they see in in uh, you know what the health and cowspiracy, and they haven't been to a farm or a ranch and talk to these people and so i think we have to we have to you know you know at the very least get educated on this stuff go talk to these people go visit the places don't just sit there and take kip the filmmaker's word at it because uh, you know that, that, that often is not the truth but amy welcome it's a pleasure to finally talk to you you know there's a lot i know there's a lot of things we can talk about you know and i know you because you 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 know and you you, you kind of, uh fairly well rounded in, in the world of nutrition and uh but obviously you know you wrote the book alzheimer's antidote i read that you know i guess i read the original early release and you then you then you revised it i guess and put out a second mm -hmm. edition so i read the first one i quite enjoyed it i thought it was a uh, you know like all of your writing it is it is fun you know you have a, you have a very uh, sort of uh, fun way to make things uh, you know uh, that that can sometimes be complicated more accessible to most people and it's enjoyable reading it even if even if i'm not interested in the subject that much I'm interested in the writing style, so that's, you know, kudos oh, to you for that. I really appreciate that. Thank you so much. I didn't know you read the book, so I'm very uh, pleasantly no, I read, surprised. I read Thank it. you. Yeah, I read it, uh, well, I don't know, was it two years, something like it, before? The yeah, there was, there was an early, like a PDF right. version that was that's a lot more I, basic, yeah. That's what I read, so, but then I was like, a lot of, you know, I'd already read it, so I didn't get the next one, but I read that <laughs> one, but I, re but I enjoyed it, but hey, yeah. let's... Uh, and I'll let Zach get in here because I tend to I kind of talk talk a lot. Sorry, Zach. <laughs> no, I'll just add, um, I haven't read the book yet, but I'm a big fan of your website, Amy. It was uh, it's always got good info on that, and I'm sure a lot of our listeners are familiar with it too. But if not, definitely check that out. And um, just to parlay a little bit on what Sean was saying, I think at Low Carb USA, two of the big topics I kept hearing coming up was like kind of um, the meat sustainability topic as well as kind of like the cholesterol stuff and like, you know, what are we what are we supposed to make with all these LDL things of low, high, medium or, you know, all that other stuff. And I know you've mm -hmm. kind of touched on that a bit too. So um, I think it's good timing for you to come on the show. Yeah, hey, Amy, let, Amy, let's get into the Alzheimer's stuff because I, I get a lot of people asking me about that and I say, wait, we're going to have Amy on the show and she, you know, knows more than I do, you know, I mean, just because you, you wrote a dang book on it and, you know, obviously... <laughs> So, I mean, you spend more time looking at it, and, you know, and, and, you know, it's kind of funny today, I mean, and, and I kind of lump all these things in together, these neurodegenerative type diseases, and whether it's Parkinson's, you know, Alzheimer's or other various kinds of dementia or ALS or all, all these things, I think there's kind of a, uh, you know, recurrent theme there, and I had a beautiful story, this lady who, you know, was suffering from multiple sclerosis, and you know, rheumatoid arthritis and psoriatic arthritis and, you know, various digestive issues and, you know, she went on a carnivorous diet and that's all gone away. It's like, it's almost miraculous to see that. Mm -hmm. But you wrote a book and it was called, you know, I want to, I want to address one, how pervasive is this problem? What do we expect to see? What are the, what are the statistics and the demographics going to look like as time goes by? I kind of know the writing's on the wall. It's not good. But you wrote a book called, well, let's talk about that first. And then, uh, you know, let's talk about the nature of the problem. How big is it? Where does it go? How much does it cost? Because those things are, I mean, I think it's shocking. 
Yeah. And, and, and then, then, then after we do that, you know, you wrote a book called The Alzheimer's Antidote. So when you talk about antidote, there's usually a poison, right? <laughs> I mean, that's how these things work. So I think we need to talk a little bit about what's the poison, what's the antidote, what do we know, what do we don't know. But let's talk about, let's just talk about the problem of Alzheimer's disease or more broadly, neurodegenerative disease in, 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 in general, if, if, you're, if you're able to. Yeah, yeah, I'll cite some statistics in a minute, but before I forget, I don't want to, I don't want to set us off track, but before I forget, Sean, I just want to say thank you for your service from one Air Force veteran to another. Um, I, I did one deployment to Iraq for six months, and I thank God that I came home safe and sound in one piece, and that wasn't the case for everybody, and I suspect there's a lot of men and women out there who owe their lives to you and your brothers and sisters in medical arms, and so thank you for your, for your service and for what you did over there. Yeah, Amy, I, I, I certainly appreciate the thanks. You know, obviously, the, the guys that actually were hurt and injured, obviously, they, they made the ultimate sacrifice. But And it was a horrible, I, I mean, I have to tell you, it was a, literally a horrible experience. But I'm glad I was there to do it. You know, and I'm, I mean, that's when I was useful because I was needed over there. And, and right. unfortunately, you know, war is not a good thing in my view. It's not pretty. Some, sometimes it's a necessary evil in some, some, some cases. But generally, it's a pretty damn negative experience. And, uh, uh, you know, I was... I felt fortunate to be able to help these people. I wish I didn't need to be there to help them, though. Right. Of course. Likewise, likewise to you. But let's get on with the, with yes. the Alzheimer's stuff. <laughs> Back to Alzheimer's. Um, so if if I remember right, I usually have a flashcard with this, but Alzheimer's, I think, right now is the is the sixth leading cause of death in the U.S. And by, I think, the 2016 or 2017 estimates put it at about $260 billion, billion with a B, the healthcare costs associated with this disease. By 2050, projections are that the healthcare cost will exceed a trillion dollars. That's trillion with a T. This disease alone could bankrupt the United States. Forget diabetes, forget heart disease. When you look at the baby boomers now, I mean, my dad's in his 70s. This this is like an, an economic tsunami, the likes of which we've never seen. And um, again, if I remember right, I think one in 10 people over the age of 65 are afflicted with this, and it's only going to get worse. And when we talk about the the financial reality it's it's not even just um it's not even just the the direct cost of long-term care or doctor visits you know we have spouses or adult children who have to give up their jobs to assume a full-time caregiving role this is not a disease like a you know like a cold or a virus or something that really only affects the one person it affects the whole family um and i think there has been an 89 percent increase a huge increase in the incidence of this illness since, I want to say 2000 or maybe 1989, somewhere thereabouts. So this is a disease like type 2 diabetes, like cardiovascular disease, that has just exploded in incidence. And it's, it's a disease that was rare to non-existent in the distant past. You know, if you look at Weston Price's writings, there's no mention of, of this kind of cognitive impairment in, in the societies that he studied anyway. So let's, I mean, you know, I know, you, and I don't know if you've done the calculations on it, and I've seen some estimates on this, but, you know, let's put it into a single person's perspective. You know, if your mother comes down with Alzheimer's disease, progressive Alzheimer's disease, what does that likely look like to you as a, as a provider or, or, or one of your loved ones? I mean, from a, from a time perspective, from a cost perspective, does insurance pay for it? How does this work? How is this going to likely affect a, a normal person? And in, in, because in, I, I think when you talk of these trillion dollars, it's just so outrageous that no one can really say, "What does that mean to me as a person?" Right. Yeah. You know what they say in Washington: a couple billion here, a couple billion there. Pretty soon, you're talking about real money. Um, in in a real person, you know this this illness causes families to go bankrupt. I mean, you could absolutely go bankrupt in in the United States, one of the wealthiest nations that the world has ever seen, and and you could lose your entire livelihood. Um, the timeline really depends. It, it's an individual thing. Some people decline very, very rapidly. Some people decline more slowly. But at least as far as we know, everybody does decline. There's no way to turn it around. There's no way to you know, completely reverse it. Like if you're on this disease path, you're going to stay on the disease path until you die. Um, and as for insurance, I think it really just depends on the individual plan as to how much of this is covered, um, how much of the long-term care, how much of those facilities, or if you have a live-in aid. Um, I think a lot of that is not covered. And it's not um, something that a lot of people plan for in their sort of long-term financial planning. 
Yeah, I had read in, in you know, the, the statistic, I can't remember where I saw it, but somebody would estimating like, you know, and, and I can't remember what year dollars is, obviously it'll get more expensive as years go by, but in recent year dollars, it was something like if your family member was afflicted with Alzheimer's disease, you can expect to spend for, for care, you know, for care, something around $50,000 a year. Uh, which, you know, that's a lot of money. I mean, you know, you got to quit your job or either become the caregiver and quit your job or you got to work another job to, to do that. And so it's, I mean, just and, from and a financial toll, perspective, yeah. Yeah, even beyond the financial toll, when you do assume that caregiving role, they've done some research into the health problems that the caregivers themselves develop because they neglect their own health. And they, you know, they're not sleeping, they're constantly stressed out. It's uh, the emotional toll to watch a parent or a spouse or a loved one sort of com literally lose their mind, completely lose their faculties. I mean, that's, I don't know that it's harder than the financial strain, but it's certainly not any easier. It's probably on par. Yeah, I mean it's safe to say. I mean, we don't we don't want to have Alzheimer's disease or any of these other neurodegenerative diseases. It's just a stressful, heartbreaking, financially destructive uh, thing for anyone to go through. Yeah, my, my my grandmother died of Alzheimer's disease, and I watched her decline over the last really decade of her life. And it was you know she's a beautiful, sweet woman, but you know she you know again she didn't know who you were. You know, it's a typical story right. you know that happens. The thing with her is she had hurt her hip, and every time she thought she kept because she couldn't remember her hip hurt chronically, and so she huh. always thought she had an acute injury. So she was oh. always upset that she had re-injured herself, and that was pretty heartbreaking to see. Yeah. But uh, but let's talk about some of the you know all you know obviously Alzheimer's. We've been looking at it intensely for the last at least several decades, trying to figure out what caused it. What have been some of the, the roads we have taken that have not been you know, been fruitful? I mean, I know that we talked about beta amyloid plaques and you know aluminum. I mean, I've heard a lot of things that that. that have gone in. Can you talk about some of the things that some of the theories that have kind of fallen out of favor, or don't have evidence to support them, and then maybe talk about, uh, you know, what may be promising? Yeah. So, um, uh, as far as I know, there's very little solid evidence implicating aluminum. Um, and I'm, I'm not afraid of deodorant. I'm not afraid of using aluminum foil in my cooking. Um, if if that's playing any role, it's a it's a small time player. It's a very small contributor. Um, the amyloid is a little more interesting. The amyloid is extremely controversial. It's it's still being debated right now as to the extent to which amyloid is driving the disease or exacerbating it. Um, I kind of I probably have to take a step back and and mention that. If, if if people are new to this, if they've never heard what I'm about to say, I mean, this might blow some minds, but they, they regularly refer to Alzheimer's disease as type 3 diabetes or diabetes of the brain. This is all over the medical literature. I didn't make up that phrase. Um, and where that comes from is that the fundamental problem in the Alzheimer's brain is that the neurons in affected regions have lost the ability to metabolize and get energy from glucose. So I say that Alzheimer's is a metabolic problem, meaning it has to do with the way the brain gets energy. And it's specific to glucose. The, the brain is no longer able to properly metabolize glucose. Um, and this doesn't happen overnight. This decline in what they call the cerebral metabolic rate of glucose is detectable in people as young as their 30s and 40s. And when at, at that age, those people have no signs or symptoms of Alzheimer's. But I think it's because they're young enough and they're still robust enough that the brain is compensating. It's only when that fuel shortage, it's an energy crisis, when that brain fuel shortage has gone on for so long that you reach a tipping point where you can no longer compensate that that's when you start showing signs and symptoms. But by the time that happens, that disease process has been going on for years and in some people decades. So do I think aluminum has anything to do with that? Unless you can show me a mechanism by which aluminum would depress or impair glucose metabolism in the brain, no, I don't think it's doing anything, maybe something very small. The amyloid, um, Amyloid, so there's the amyloid hypothesis, and they, so amyloid is a protein that is secreted by the neurons, and it's secreted by other cells in the body too, but we're mainly talking about the neurons here, and it's a totally normal process. Everybody secretes amyloid, no big deal. The problem in the Alzheimer's brain is that these amyloid proteins are not cleared away properly. It's like the, the sanitation crew is on strike. So these proteins build up. They build up outside the cell, and once they reach a certain concentration, they sort of like cross-link together and form into these infamous amyloid plaques. And these amyloid plaques actually get in the way of neuronal communication. They block the synapses between the neurons. It's like this 
just gunk that that mucks up the works for, for lack of a scientific term and so it kind of makes sense wow if all this amyloid protein and these plaques are, are getting in the way of neuronal communication well then amyloid must cause alzheimer's well that's a slam dunk except they've developed several drugs now to target these plaques to, to reduce the formation of these proteins and plaques every single one of these drugs has been a failure and I always say that they've been a success in that they do reduce the formation of the, these proteins and plaques but reducing these proteins and plaques has done nothing to stop the Alzheimer's from getting worse and it doesn't do anything to turn it around and there is plenty of people who um, die from Alzheimer's disease and on autopsy they're found to not have significant plaque buildup in their brain and there's people who die from other causes with no signs or symptoms of Alzheimer's that do have significant plaque buildup. So either these plaques are not the main cause or they're not a cause or they're not the main cause. And one of these drugs, the, the, the phase three clinical trial had to be stopped early because the people on the drug were doing so much worse than the people on the placebo that they deemed it unethical to continue. So every time we try to get rid of this amyloid, people with Alzheimer's actually get worse. Um, and I, I don't know how, how much you want me to go into detail now with, with how amyloid is cleared away and why that's a problem but you know well i mean again i'm not sure who's going to be listening in here so it may be above some people's head but i don't mind we talk, i think we can talk as long as you have time to talk um you know one thing and zach i'm gonna let you get in here you know you know maybe amy and i'll talk about alzheimer then you can pick your topic and pick her brain on that but <laughs> no, that's, that's, but um that's good stuff. you know the uh the one thing you know as we see this with almost any other sort of you know, now prominent Western diseases, we see an earlier and earlier onset. We're seeing diabetes in mm -hmm. teenagers and, and, and even preschool kids. And so are we seeing a similar trend with earlier onset Alzheimer's disease? And and I know you talked about that, that some of this brain metabolism, you know, which you're postulating or many people postulate may contribute to this in, in some way or in a large way. Is, is that detectable? Uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure you can do, I'm sure you can do some sort of maybe PET scans in the brain or something like that is there a way to sort of nip this thing in the butter or, or say, Hey man, you're, you're, you've already got the, the early brain disease of Alzheimer's disease, even though you're not yet clinically affected, you know? So, so are we seeing it at younger, younger ages? Because I can imagine, you know, if you're a 20 year old kid and your 50 year old mom comes down with Alzheimer's disease, you're kind of screwed. So, so I mean, uh, well, or, or you just hope, you know, stick her in a home and hope she doesn't die or something. But, but I mean, I'm serious. I mean, it's, it, it's a really problem. So am I, am I, am I, overstating my my fear or is that is there any reality in that no i think there's a huge reality in that um they used to joke and call alzheimer's disease old timers disease you know and because it used to be that this really only affected people in their 80s and 90s it was always people's grandparents oh you know grandma's oh, she's losing her mind she's like they, they used to call it senile senility with with older people except we are no longer talking about very elderly people we're talking about people in their 50s and 60s um this is no longer exclusively an illness of very elderly people and i just turned 40 the older i get the younger those ages sound like to, you know i know you're in your 50s like 60 like i said my dad's in his early 70s that to me still sounds young at this point um you know especially because we have longer lifespans now and it is true that our population is aging. We've got the boomers aging. So it's it makes sense that a disease that does preferentially strike older people is going to increase in incidence. But again, we're not just talking about elderly people. And yeah, you're right. It is actually a PET scan. That's how they measure the, the cerebral glucose usage. But, you know, I don't recommend that like someone in their 20s and 30s gets that done. There's other risk factors. And certainly it does, it runs in families to some extent. There is a genetic component to it. Maybe we can get into that in a little bit. But, you know, there is no no generic, no genetic heritage is a death sentence. Nobody's genetically programmed to get this disease. Um, it, it runs in families likely because our diets and lifestyles tend to run in families. You know, we eat what we were raised to eat. We live the way we were conditioned as kids. You know, some of us change as we get older, but um, it is definitely happening younger. And I I think we can all agree there's probably a reason for that. You know, it's it, people take for granted, even in the conventional medical world at this point, we take it for granted that diet and lifestyle play a role in things like 
type 2 diabetes and cardiovascular disease and obesity and PCOS and, and, you know, infertility, all of these issues that have exploded in incidence over the last few decades, no one even questions that anymore, that diet and lifestyle play a role, if not the driving role. And why is it that when it comes to Alzheimer's, the ins- a, a rare, a once rare disease that has also totally exploded in parallel with those other conditions, why do we completely dismiss even the possibility that this is also a diet and lifestyle disease, or at least that there's a major role for diet and lifestyle? And, and you, to, to your question again about the young people, yeah, the time to prevent Alzheimer's to the extent that we can probably prevent it is, is yesterday, is as soon as you can, is to get healthy, to stay metabolically healthy. You know, you don't want to have to turn the Titanic around when you're 82 and you're already in the disease process. You want to prevent it from happening and you need to start that as early as you can. So Amy, let's get into, uh, you know, so based on what you think and what, you, what you've learned, what does the evidence support as to potentially the, 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 the potential cause of Alzheimer's disease? And then, you know, I agree that the, the cure is actually the prevention probably is the best thing to do with this. But um, so what, what, what are you finding out? What did you discover? What do you think people need to know about how to prevent this? And then let's talk about some people that may be showing signs of it. And what does the uh, what's been done that's showing some success or some promise with that? Mm-hmm. So um, it's, I just lost my train of thought. Um, it's, it's totally not controversial at all that the problem in Alzheimer's is a lack of fuel to the neurons because of glucose metabolism impairment or however we want to call it. What we don't know is why. We don't know why that's happening. I mean, we could speculate that you know, after decades and decades of a poor diet, whether it's too much refined carbohydrate or maybe too much refined carbs in combination with the vegetable oils, you know, the, the easily oxidized omega-6, it could, it, it could be multifactorial. I personally think the refined carbs are probably the number one driver, but there's coming at it in other ways. There are nutrients that the brain needs. You know, co- healthy cognition doesn't happen in a vacuum. You need zinc, you need iodine, you need DHA, you need cholesterol. So, I mean, I don't know if we want to get into statin drugs at some point. The brain is built out of fat and cholesterol, and you need all of these various nutrients to make proper cognition happen. And and the modern diet is, is depending on what you eat, the modern diet can be very low in some of this. And um, because it's a problem with energy generation, we want to look at the mitochondria. And the mitochondria get, you know, mitochondrial damage is kind of like a, or mitochondrial dysfunction. It's such a buzzword now. I feel like people don't even really know what it is. But the mitochondria are the the energy factories of the cells. That's where most of the energy is produced. So if Alzheimer's is is an energy crisis, there's probably something wrong with the mitochondria. And the most damaging thing to mitochondria is the constant ceaseless metabolism of glucose. You've got all these reactive oxygen species, all of this oxidative damage that's damaging the membranes, oxidizing the fats within the mitochondrial membrane. So um, that's that's maybe a little advanced, but this this is a very savvy audience. I know your listeners. Um, <laughs> so, I, but we still we still don't know why. That's my speculation as to why it's happening. Um, I think the mitochondria are becoming so damaged from all the years of these sort of nutritional insults. And and when you combine that, maybe with some of these subclinical or over nutrient deficiencies. Um, and then, uh, you know, we haven't even touched on one of the most important things. We, we kind of talked about the family history or but one of the most important, most powerful risk factors for Alzheimer's disease is chronically high insulin. Regardless of your family history, regardless of your genetics, if you have chronically high insulin, you were at higher risk for this illness, period. And even though we they call it type 3 diabetes, that's a little misleading because there's going to be millions of people, without exaggeration, millions of people walking around with totally normal blood glucose and even totally normal hemoglobin A1C. But those things are only normal because very, very high insulin is keeping the sugar in check. So you can't just go by the blood sugar because you might think, well, I'm not diabetic. You know, grandpa's not diabetic. If you have cognitive problems, you probably have raging high insulin, even if your glucose is normal. Yeah, I mean, and that is, again, a lot of people sort of miss out on the insulin stuff. And but 
You know, it's kind of interesting, and I, and I think I observe this, and I think maybe you, you, you can speak to this a little bit, but I know my grandmother, and again, this is a personal anecdotal stuff, and this is 10, 15 years before I knew anything about insulin or what it did, but I mean, she, her last years of life, the only thing she would literally eat were sweets. I mean, that was the only thing, and I think it was probably because she was desperately starving to get glucose to her brain, perhaps, that's why she preferred that. Are you seeing that as something that, that we see in these people as they get end stage as well, or is that uh, a common no, finding? Yeah, actually, the, yes, it is a common finding. They've done some research on this, and they do find that people with dementia, and I don't know if it's just in the late stages, but they do crave sugar. And I, I think it's exactly like you said. They're probably so desperate to get fuel to the brain, but of course, there's other ways to get fuel to the brain. But I also wonder, you know, do they crave more sugar, or is it that people who eat a lot of sugar end up with Alzheimer's disease, you know, I, it, but it's not, I don't want to demonize all carbohydrate, you know, um, it's, it would be ridiculous for me to say that, you know, cantaloupe causes Alzheimer's disease or lentils cause Alzheimer's. So it's not, it's not those foods per se. I mean, look, look all around the world. We have billions of healthy people who age gracefully with all their cognitive faculties intact, who don't eat ketogenic diets, who don't eat carnivorous diets, who eat carbohydrate, but they don't eat carbohydrate in the way that we do in North America in the 21st century, you know. Um, yeah, I mean, sure. And, and, and again, I know that you guys like Tucker Goodrich would say, you know, maybe maybe there's more implication of the vegetable oil than we think. Mm -hmm. and, and that certainly could be the difference there. And, I, you know, I, you know I, I think that's I think I think we don't understand everything about glucose metabolism. I think there's you know, maybe it's fructose, which is even a, even a bigger problem for for some of the disease process, maybe we get Robert Lustig on there to talk about that at some point. Um, you know, one of the, this, the recurrent themes, you know, we all, you know, you and I, we all see this. We, we see this common pattern in almost all diseases, whether it's obesity, cancer, cardiovascular disease, renal disease. Uh, you know, we, we just see this generally poor metabolic profile. And I know guys like Grant Schofield out of New Zealand talks about a unifying theory of chronic disease. And, and, and the, the finger is squarely pointing at, at hyperinsulinemia or, or insulin dysregulation and so mm -hmm. you know as a general heuristic i mean you might want to say the things that make you not insulin resistance and, and you know those proxy measures the best we can tell keeping a decent weight to height ratio keeping your blood pressure normal keeping your uh you know your triglycerides down and some of these other things that we, we generally see maybe not perfect but uh, those this might be a general just rule to say how do I prevent not only Alzheimer's disease or some other neurodegenerative disease but disease in general and, and limit aging. I think aging to some degree is metabolic dysfunction and the metabolic machinery breaking apart and I think the longer we can you know maintain normal health, normal metabolism, maintain we can I like to say if I can if I can maintain a normal healthy appetite and not get fat I mean, I'm I think I'm pretty met metabolically healthy. I remember when I was a kid, I could just eat and eat and eat and eat. You wouldn't gain weight. And I, and I mean, I'm doing the same thing now. It's, it's all meat. And I'm eating and eating and eating four or five pounds of meat a day, and I'm not getting fat. So to me, that's like, that's probably a good thing to have a good healthy appetite and, and at the same time not find yourself, you know, suffering from, from the consequence of that. And so anyway, so talk about... Um, what do we do? What I mean, I know because uh, what's the fellow's name, Doctor Bresden? Is it? I'm, I'm pronouncing. Oh, Bredesen, that right. yeah. Mm -hmm. Bredesen, yeah. Out of, out of, I think he's out of somewhere in California, San Francisco, yeah. maybe. I know he's done some some work on this. I know you're familiar with that work, and and maybe some other people. Can you talk about what's being done either on the prevention side or on the the quote unquote uh, mitigation side? I'm not going to call it cure, but I'm going to call it mitigation side. Yeah, yeah. The the mitigation side. I mean. The, the cornerstone of a mitigation strategy, in my opinion, should be a ketogenic diet because the fascinating or, or the most promising thing about Alzheimer's is that even though the glucose metabolism is impaired, ketone metabolism is not. And they've shown this not just in mice, not just in cultured petri dish neurons, but in, in human beings with Alzheimer's disease and with the precursor myocognitive impairment. When they get these people's ketones elevated, whether it's through a ketogenic diet or with these exogenous ketones, they do have better cognition. And it's not a slam dunk, you know, not everybody improves as much as others it's it's the individual response varies but this is the most promising way to go because if it's a fuel shortage and it's specific to glucose well wouldn't it be great if we could provide some sort of alternative fuel to these starving struggling neurons and lo and behold as i'm sure a lot of the listeners know ketones are an excellent excellent fuel for the brain um, and an older sort of demented brain is not going to take up and use
use ketones as readily and as much as a younger person, but they, the brain will still take up and use them. Um, as for, so, I mean, I, I, I'll talk about the, maybe the exogenous ketones in a minute, but other strategies like Dr. Bredesen's protocol, he calls it, I think, keto light. He's, he's a little, a little sort of still wary of animal fat and kind of the saturated fat and, and red meat and stuff like that, you know, but to each their own, at least the conversation is moving in the right direction. So there's that, but you know, his protocol also calls for, um, exercise, a, I forget how a certain amount of sleep, a little bit of fasting, like a minimum of 12 hours between, between, you know, dinner one evening and breakfast the next morning. So a minimum of 12 hours, um, uh, supplementation and hormone replacement on an individual basis, you know, based on their particular lab work. Um, so there's a whole lot that goes into it because, you know, it may not just be diet. There are, it's probably, we don't know for sure, but it's probably a confluence of factors that if you only had one or two of those problems, maybe you would be fine. But when you have five or six of them, it creates the perfect storm to really, you know, damage the brain. Um, but, but the, the, the exogenous ketones, I think they're, they're very controversial. In general, I'm not the biggest fan of them because I think they're being mismarketed. They're not instant ketosis. They're not a fat loss tool. They're not a type 2 diabetes reversal tool. But in the cases of neurodegenerative diseases, whether it's um, Alzheimer's or Parkinson's or, or MS, I do think they can be really helpful because especially in the case of Alzheimer's, if somebody's very elderly or very severely impaired, you are not going to get them to do a ketogenic diet. I mean, let's be realistic. You're not going to get a 79 year old man who's been eating a bagel every day for 50 years and drinking his juice. You're not going to get him to have eggs cooked in butter overnight. So um, in those cases, if somebody can't or won't adhere to a ketogenic diet, by God, use the exogenous ketones, like get these people's brains ketones any way you can. But those exogenous ketones have a short half-life. I think it's only 90 minutes or so and they're gone. So you have to keep taking them. They're expensive as hell. Why not do both? Why not take exogenous ketones and do a ketogenic diet where at least your own body is producing ketones 24 um, seven? And, and then, I mean, the exogenous ketones, will provide fuel to the brain in the short term, but that's like a band-aid over the symptom. That's just fixing the one symptom of, of memory loss of cognitive impairment. Whereas I think the diet, especially if it's implemented early enough, like we were saying, somebody in their fifties or sixties, if you catch it as early as possible and implement a diet that reduces all the damage from glucose, you know, reduces the omega-6 oils, change your lifestyle a bit, I think that that could go some way toward actually not just slowing the progression, but actually reversing some of the damage. Maybe not all of it, but you know, Dr. Bredesen is doing some really fascinating research and, and the studies are kind of small now, but at this point, people are taking it upon themselves to do it. So there's a lot of, you know, quote unquote, anecdotal data out there that hopefully we can start collecting. But unfortunately, the mainstream, you will never hear this from the Alzheimer's Association. You have never heard them say that this is a glucose metabolism problem in the brain. Maybe you should get yourself some ketones. You never hear that from them. So unfortunately, people have to do this on their own. Yeah, I'll just make one last comment and I'll let Zach start to chime in. I, I'm all in on the, all the Alzheimer's, Alzheimer's comments. <laughs> so I've got some questions for you, so we might have to make it the Alzheimer's show. <laughs> the, uh, you know, I think the uh, just the general... Um, you know, the general topic about, you know, uh, doing something, you know, letting your body do it naturally, going to ketosis naturally versus, you know, adding, you know, again, like a, an exogenous supplement or exogenous whatever, you know, it tends to be the, 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 the former tends to be more effective than the latter in almost all cases from what, I, what you know, it just in, in my general sense of things. And, uh, you know, I think that's, this goes back to the point of the, just this whole entire community is you know you have to realize you may not ever get the support you you feel you're going to need from these big institutions it's it's sometimes you know it's like if you don't like the game the way the game is laid out then you just change the game and you know do you, you know you just say okay forget it we'll, we'll do it by ourselves we'll do it as a community we'll do it via social media and i think that we're seeing more and more on that and i think it's becoming very effective because you know quite honestly where do you and I get our information these days is mostly via social media. It's mostly by people that are out there influencing. It might be Beyonce telling me to go vegan or drink a Coke. But, <laughs> but I mean, that is what's going on. And so whether we want to acknowledge that or not, 
sometimes you just can't wait for these big agencies or these big patient advocacy groups because, we, we, as we all know, they get different funding sources and they're limited to what they can say. Maybe even people within that organization know that this may be the right thing to do, but they're hamstrung for whatever reason, or, or maybe they don't believe in it. But I think yeah. that's a, you know, that's just a general uh, thought that I'm seeing you know, throughout well, things. You, you bring up a good point, and I do want to say, you know, I don't want to oversimplify this. There is a lot we don't know about this. There's a lot of research that remains to be done, but I, I, I try to emphasize to people, just because we don't know everything doesn't mean we don't know anything. And in my opinion, the science, the science behind Alzheimer's as a metabolic disease is solid enough to take matters into your own hands if you want to. Um, you know, if I didn't think it was solid enough, I wouldn't have put it into a book. Um, and it, it, this is not new. Like, if I can emphasize anything to the audience, none of this is new. This glucose metabolism identification goes back decades. Um, it's, it's been in the medical literature for many years. And I know it takes a long time for it to trickle down to the average GP's office, the average neurologist's office. But, you know, this isn't like our friend Dave Feldman's work, who, like, is literally rewriting the paradigm right now. Um, some of this stuff goes back a long time. And I just don't know why it hasn't become more accepted um i i i this and i i feel a little bit shaky sometimes telling people well we don't know everything but we know enough because that's very reminiscent of what happened if in, like with the mcgovern commission when they said the low fat diet cut back on red meat when they were like we don't have time to wait for the data right you scientists have the time like people are dying we don't have the time to wait I think that the data, is, or I should say are, right, data is plural, the data are solid enough. I don't think this is a gamble. I don't think it's a crapshoot. I, I think it's very solid. Well, and, and, you know, again, just to, McGovern, you know, as he was being influenced, you know, I'm a senator, I don't have time for science, so on and so forth, back in, what was it, 1977 or whenever that commission went on. You know, then we ended up with the dietary guidelines, which arguably were a disaster. But, you know, and, and I think this is a thing is, you know, you, you're, you, people they keep telling me, you know, we the science is settled. We have a consensus. I'm like, that doesn't that isn't even that is, that is not even a scientific statement to say you have a scientific consensus means you don't believe in science, in my view, <laughs> uh, because it always it always changes, as you know, and you'll see whatever I say, reader quote will change five years from now. But I think that the thing is. The only thing that ultimately matters are the results that you get personally, and I, that's why I encourage people, try something, try it for three months, it'll either work or it won't, yeah. and the results will speak for themselves. It's not like you've, you know, like, if you want to go on a carnivore diet, what did you lose? You ate a bunch of steaks. Big deal. <laughs> you know, it either works or it doesn't. Right. And, uh, and so, and, and just to the point, you know, in my view, and again, I'm, I'm highly biased, I, I, I certainly believe in... This, this carnivorous thing, I, you know, I'm certainly, I, I have no illusions that I don't have rose-colored glasses when it comes to this stuff, but I see consistently people on a ketogenic diet doing, you know, good, and then I see very often people who go carnivorous do just a little bit better, and so maybe, you know, not to not to contradict Dr. Bredesen, but you know, maybe it might be that a ketogenic carnivorous diet might even be even more powerful, but who knows? We'll have to see. And let's you know, in, in, in my opinion, it would be. I, I, I have so <laughs> much respect for Dr. Bredesen, so I think what he's doing is fabulous, but I certainly don't think a ketogen, a full-on ketogenic diet or a carnivorous diet would be any worse. And, and I mean, there's reason to believe it would be better. I We don't know for sure, um, but... Um, I just, you know, I think some of the, you know, because they look at the mechanism, they, they look at the underpinning mechanism, and then they look at what are the things that would, would improve that mechanism, and it's pretty clear, but then they're like, they've got this fear that Ansel Keys and others instilled in us, and we've got this, you know, cholesterol is bad, saturated is fat, bad is bad, so I can't possibly recommend this, or I'll be branded a heretic like, yes, like, I like, think, like me, you know. <laughs> I think that's where Bredesen is. I think deep down, he probably knows that there's nothing wrong with red meat and butter, and he he can't for whatever reason come right out and say it. But you know, like like you were saying, with whether it's trying carnivore or trying keto, in in the specific case of Alzheimer's, people have nothing to lose by trying it because there are literally zero effective pharmaceutical drugs. None. There are a couple of drugs on the market available for this, but they do nothing. They are totally palliative. They do nothing to stop the disease from getting worse, nothing to turn it around. You have nothing to lose by giving up sugar and starch for a couple of months. And I you, I do think you have to be in it in the long haul. It, it's not going to happen overnight. Some people, maybe you will notice a very dramatic change in a short time. But, uh, you know, the brain, like, 
when people use keto or, or carnivore for type 2 diabetes or obesity, they tend to lose weight very quickly. Um, some of their, like, like the stories that keep coming in, joint pain goes away immediately. Acid reflux goes away immediately. Some of these things clear up almost overnight. Alzheimer's, unfortunately, if we can make a dent in it, I think it takes a lot longer. But um, like I said, y there, there's no alternative. There is no pharmaceutical alternative, not that's effective anyway. There's nothing to lose by trying this. And if I can just maybe for like 60 seconds or something touch on, I think Bredesen and other Alzheimer's researchers are wary of the saturated fat and the red meat because of the influence on the ApoE4 gene. And, you know, probably some of the people listening, if they're worried about Alzheimer's, they've heard of ApoE4 or some of the cholesterol hyperresponders are probably ApoE4s. And the ApoE4 gene is the strongest risk factor, the strongest known genetic risk factor for Alzheimer's. People with one copy are at increased risk. People with two copies, what we call homozygous, are at like substantially increased risk. It's something on the order of 50 to 90% chance that they will develop Alzheimer's. But if you have a 50% chance of developing Alzheimer's, you have a 50% chance of not developing Alzheimer's. So what is it that flips that switch? You know, like I said earlier, nobody's genetically programmed to get Alzheimer's. And I think they're wary of the saturated fat specifically for the E4s because when they eat saturated fat, their what their LDL tends to skyrocket. Some of the lipids tend to go in what the conventional medical world would interpret as unfavorable direction. You know, like like the three of us and the audience listening may disagree with what is a favorable versus an unfavorable cholesterol profile. But I think that's where the fear comes from because the ApoE4s do have very significantly increased risk, not just for Alzheimer's, but for stroke, for cardiovascular disease. But why? So the ApoE4 gene, it's, it's theorized that the ApoE4 is the oldest human variation of this e, the ApoE gene. The ApoE2 and 3 appeared later in human evolution. So the E4 is believed to be the one that was forged in the hunter-gatherer times or even before then. So it's the worst match for the modern diet and lifestyle, for the super high refined carbs, the, the super saturated vegetable oil diet that we have. So it's not that ApoE4 is not a damaging gene, it's not a harmful gene. What it is is just the worst you know, mismatch for the modern diet because plenty of people who have Alzheimer's disease don't have any ApoE4, let alone two. They're ApoE2 or three. Um, and there's plenty of people who are homozygous for E4 that don't develop Alzheimer's. So like this E4 doesn't cause it at all. It, it definitely does increase risk, but only when combined with the garbage diet that we're eating today. Yeah, I mean, and that is, a, again, a recurrent theme. Whether you look at cholesterol, you have to look at the context with that sin. So whether your genetics, your genetics are what they are going to be. And so, you know, I would, I would, you know, and you probably know this data, but if I, if I were to say, what is the risk of an APO, you know, uh, 4E developing, you know, Alzheimer's disease relative to LDL concentration, and then, and then compare that to insulin status. And I would imagine just like I overcome in shows with heart disease that probably if your insulin is super high, LDL is a minor player, you know, you know relative, in a rel relative fashion. So I yes. think, again, it comes as, and I think you eloquently said, April 4, April 4 e is a big problem if you eat a junky garbage American diet, which is, you know, which, and we can, we can debate what that is. You know, I will say meat is not a problem, but it's, the, the you know, again, the refined carbohydrates, the processed sugar, you know, blah, 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 blah. We've all heard it over and over again. Zach, yeah. I'm going to get a drink of water. Right. You've got to the next question. Yeah, no, this is all really interesting. I think I've learned more about Alzheimer's in the last 40 minutes than the the, the rest of my life combined. So I, right. I what I, what interests me the most about this, and it's a topic I've been uh, kind of more looking at uh, recently, is kind of how so much of this stuff is all interconnected. So like as you were kind of going over with some of the Alzheimer's stuff, I was like trying to connect dots as to like, oh, that makes sense with in other areas as well. And uh, feel free to correct me if I'm oversimplifying here. But uh, one thing that I kind of thought of as as you were breaking all that down is like when when I talked to Dr. Volick about like, you know, low carb ketogenic, um, you know, he's he'll he'll tell you that like when when people ask him, like, well, what about these people who follow a high carbohydrate diet and seemingly are like really healthy people uh, and he'll say like you know there is there's enough variance in humans that he he suspects it's like 
like a third of the population is just very robust when it comes to like carbohydrate tolerance and they're just less likely to get insulin resistance. And those folks are likely the ones who are probably doing very well on a high carbohydrate diet. But those other two thirds, they could follow the exact same program and end up in a, in a disaster situation, you know, typically in their 30s, 40s and, you know, going forward as their as their body is less robust and less able to kind of tolerate that stuff. And, you know, I see it all the time in the athletic world in the sense that, you know, we have these athletes that are like incredible at, you know, performing on high levels of carbohydrates and then they start to peter out in their 30s and 40s. Um, and it's always interesting to me. So I guess my, my question as I kind of slowly get around to it is like, uh, if we're looking at it kind of in that context where there's folks that are more resilient and folks that are less resilient, is there is that kind of similar with Alzheimer's then where like the folks who tend to be more prone or genetically uh, more likely to get it, are they the folks that are kind of ins more likely to be insulin resistant? Um, and then like, do you think like the increase in Alzheimer's uh, is something to do with like, uh, you know, I, I just see with the diet trends that we've had the last couple of decades where like it becomes very, uh, you know, it's, it's very well advertised that you should avoid cholesterol, avoid saturated fat. And when you're pulling foods with that out, you're leaving yourself with a very high likelihood of getting something that's more refined and more uh, carbohydrate, refined carbohydrate laden. So it's kind of almost like this perfect storm of we're taking away like some of these fuels that would really power the brain, replacing them with fuels that are going to almost like burn the brain out over time. And then we're left with symptoms that result in things like Alzheimer's disease and heart disease and all these other things that can be connected to like insulin resistance. Yeah, I, um, I don't think you're oversimplifying. It's, um, insulin resistance definitely is a risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. And I think part of the reason that it does strike more when we're older is because insulin resistance tends to increase as we get older. And and there's, you know, we, we're not really sure why I would suspect, and, and you both would probably agree to some extent, that it has a lot to do with the loss of muscle mass and the loss of, of um, of a glucose sink, if you will, like of somewhere for that glucose to go. Like you said, all these athletes, when they're young, when they are working out or performing hours upon hours a day, that glucose has somewhere to go. And it still may not be the, the healthiest thing for them to do, but in terms of like not gaining weight or not having signs and symptoms, they're fine. But you like all these retired football players in their 50s and 60s, they look like hell, you know, and they, they start to develop all these problems because they're still eating like a 25 year old football player, but they're not a 25 year old football player anymore. And I, I do think there is a lot of genetic, very, uh, you know, genetic or ethnic variation in carbohydrate tolerance. Because certainly, you know, not everybody needs to follow a ketogenic diet to be metabolically healthy. What you do have to do is stay within your own level of carbohydrate and insulin safety. And for some people, that's going to be 20 to 30 grams of carbs a day or zero grams of carbs a day. For some people, that's going to be 100 or 150 or 200 grams a day. I don't think anybody needs to be eating 300 or 350 grams a day, but... Um, you know, you, you have to stay within your own level. And, and it, like, like I said earlier, there are obviously billions of people around the world who eat a higher carb diet. But I think, and I, I'm willing to be wrong, this is my own opinion here, when people say, well, what about the Asians? And they eat all that rice. And what about this group and that group that eats bread or blah, blah, blah? I don't think they understand the context there because it's not like the Asians are eating a pound of rice a day or like, multiple huge servings there they have very small portions they have like a little bowl of rice and then a lot of fermented vegetables a little bit of egg you know i studied i was a korean linguist in the air force actually so i know a lot about the korean culture do they eat a lot of rice yes but they also eat a lot of pickled vegetables um egg a little bit of pork chicken fish obviously seafood so even in these cultures that ate a quote-unquote high carb diet i actually think they have a relatively low calorie diet and the the total low energy identity of the diet even if you're eating a fair amount of carbs if the total amount of food energy is not all that much i don't think insulin is going to be that high you know or and it may have a genetic component too that those people do have a higher carb tolerance so it's it, it may be both but um or when they eat though you know the carbs those populations tend to not combine it with high fat yeah. so 
yeah that you know that that's an excellent um comment um that actually actually brings up kind of the or a nice transition into what i was going to ask next too and and you kind of sort of already started answering it and one thing that i'm really interested in right now is we had dave feldman on the show and when we had him on he was telling us about his most latest uh suspicions as well as tests he's gonna have done and if i remember correctly like we had him on right before his last CAC scan. So he was going to go in for folks who aren't familiar. He's been going in every like six months to the same lab, same technician, same machine and getting uh, this uh, coronary artery calcification scan, which is looking right. at the thickness of his artery walls. Zach, yeah, he was actually getting a CIMT test. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Oh. So, yeah. yeah. So, okay. So he's getting in there and he's getting his, his artery walls, the, the thickness of them or thinness of them. Uh, the carotids. Me yeah. yeah. Measured. So, uh, he was uh, basically following a, a, a pretty strict ketogenic diet with uh, his energy requirements uh, accounted for and noticed over time those, those, the thickness of his artery walls were actually getting thinner. Um, and then he did his little N equals one experiment where he went back to a standard American diet and it was a standard American diet with the intent of gaining weight if I'm not mistaken. And, and he did a fine job of that. I think he gained like 20 pounds or something like that, um, which kind of highlights what you just said. So like when he went in and got that next, that next test, uh, it showed like almost complete regression back to where he was before the start of the ketogenic diet. Um, so like, do you think that like, had he balanced that standard American diet to meet energy demand, he would have seen a much, uh, a much more favorable result there as opposed to kind of having that that scenario where it ended up kind of reversing back to where it was before uh, he started the ketogenic diet? Um, I honestly don't know. And, and Dave's a good friend. I, I saw him when he was heavier on the low carb <laughs> cruise and God bless his wife. His wife was there too. And we said, you know, you know, we all think you should win like a Nobel prize, right? <laughs> Just for, for being so patient. Cause Dave told the story of when he approached, you know, honey, I'd like to gain 20 pounds for science. Would you be okay with that? And she said, well, you're, you're going to lose it, right? So um, anyway, the, the two of them are just great. But I, I don't know what the answer to that question is. My suspicion would be that it may, the, the thickness may have progressed a little bit, but probably not as much. You know, if, because he was doing sort of high carb, high fat, like you said, a standard mm -hmm. American diet. I think he was eating pizzas and hoagies or something. Um, it might have been really different if he was eating like nothing but sweet potatoes and white rice or, but I don't know. Yeah, let me, I'll just put in my two cents because I can never, never help not doing that. But, uh, <laughs> you know, and, and it's kind of interesting because we always see that, you know, there, and, and there's this battle between the calories in versus calories out. It's all about, you know, maintaining a caloric deficit versus a hormone people. And, I, and honestly, I think there's truth in both of those things. And I don't like to get in between. I just like, I just say what works is what works. And I don't necessarily care why. I mean, it's interesting to know, but ultimately you want to know what works. And so that's kind of where I come from. It, it may seem very caveman-ish, but I'm like, I don't really, I don't want to wait forever. I just want to find something that works. But you know, it's interesting because we see these people that will they'll point out these guys that go on the Twinkie diet or the potato diet or the ice cream diet, and they'll keep it at a caloric, you know, deficit, and they will lose weight, and their body composition won't be bad. It would be interesting at some point to, to maybe check those guys, you know, and say, let's let's look at these things, let's look at these markers of carotid intermedial thickness or something like that, and see is even though your, uh, you know, even though your weight was lower, and, and again, it's not all about weight loss. Doesn't weight loss doesn't necessarily always translate to health. In right. my view, and there's there's a lot of it, and I know Amy. We, we, there's a lot of things you can rant about, and I, I love seeing you do that. <laughs> I totally and one of the th you know, one of the things we talk, you know, that I talk about is, you know, it's it's about getting healthy. You know, getting, you know, lose, you know, get healthy, then lose weight. Don't lose weight to get healthy because they're not necessarily the same thing. And it's just that, you know, we like, you know, we just don't have the data on that stuff. And so my my suspicion is, you know, if you don't gain a bunch of extra weight, probably it's a better situation. We don't know that for sure. Uh, that would be that'd be room for test. There's just so much stuff out there we don't know. Uh, you know, as far as the stuff is that we speculate about and how they get studied, who's going to study, who's going to fund it, you know, and it may it ultimately may be, you know, some private guy and a bunch of knuckleheads on the internet do some of this stuff, you know, kind of what I'm trying to do. And then hopefully I'll be able to somehow get some more support for this stuff in, in a financial fashion so we can do it in a more robust fashion. Maybe these cattlemen people can help with that. But um, and then, and then, you know, you got to have it independently reproduced by, you know, cause you, you know, if you involve these people, they're, oh, they paid for it, blah, blah, blah. So then say, that's fine. Okay. It's out there. Somebody else reproduce it. That's not funded, you know, funded by someone independently and that's fine. Uh, so anyway, 
That was my. I just rambled. Amy. Well, no, but I, I love that because the beauty of that is look look at the people that are experimenting with carnivore. They're not waiting for a clinical trial. They don't need a clinical trial to tell them that their joint pain is gone and their acne cleared up and their period came back and their headaches are gone. Like they don't need the clinical data and they don't care about the clinical data. And and like you said, I'm not saying we we shouldn't aim to get that clinical data at some point, but they don't. They know they feel better. That's all they care about, you know? Well, and there's, you know, again, there's a big group of people that says, well, how do you know you feel better? Well, I mean, my knee, my knee, doesn't, my knee doesn't hurt anymore. Well, that doesn't count. I mean, to me, that's insane yeah. logic, but I fight that every day. It's like, show yeah. me a lab, show me a blood test that tells me your knee doesn't hurt anymore. Right. <laughs> I don't know. I can't, I don't know what one it is, but, you know, you know, so it's, it's just it's this sort of perpetual you know, we have been brainwashed to believe that, you know, well, we've been brainwashed to believe that the food we've been eating for thousands and millions of years is now bad for us. We've been brainwashed to believe that our health is not what we think it is, that we, we're not smart enough to figure out if our knee doesn't hurt anymore. You know, this is a, this is a sort of sort of thing you have to fight, and hopefully common sense will prevail. You know, it's, it's sometimes it's, it's a simple answer, not a complex one. You know, as well as I do, the more you read, it's fascinating, but then it just gets more confusing. And you're like, how actionable is that information for me? Or how much anxiety does it provoke? Or am I sitting there worried about how much methionine versus glycine I get in my meal? And I tell oh, people, oh my goodness, you know, I just tell people, <laughs> just eat a damn steak and don't worry about this stuff. I, but, I could know. not agree more. And I don't, I don't know that I would say I could not agree more with the eat a damn steak. I mean, I, I support whatever <laughs> works. So if, if somebody finds that a carnivore diet works better for them than garden variety keto, then, then do it. I'm not, I'm not opposed to carnivore at all, but, um, I could agree more about this obsession with lab values and this obsession with tracking the ketones and the blood sugar and this and that and you know if you want to use that data do it but every you know like like you said the word anxiety is is where it is I get emails from people and you can feel the fear and anxiety radiating out of the of the screen because and it's I'm not saying, and I'm sure you wouldn't say this either, lab values are not meaningless. They're not, we shouldn't dismiss them entirely. But um, I almost, almost wish we couldn't measure anything. You just had to go by how you feel, how your energy is, how your skin looks, you know, how your nails look like. There's all this sort of Eastern medicine stuff that we ignore in the West. When, when you know, like as a nutritionist, a lot of the clients I get are on the phone, so I can't put my eyes on them, which is, you know, it. It's a more convenient business model, but I lose something and not actually being able to look at somebody. They can tell me how much they weigh or how tall they are, but unless I, do they look well? Do they look ro robust? Is their skin luminous? Or do they look haggard and run down and, and unwell? Um, but so these lab values, like we can use them as a guide and to inform certain, you know, interv I, I can't use the word treatment, I'm not a physician, to inform certain nutritional interventions, but we can't live and die by them. And because what I love about Dave's work, and I think I think Dr. Ted Naiman says this a lot too, and, and you say this very often, Sean, so many of these numbers are so much more malleable and, and transient than we ever realized. And Dave's showing that with the with cholesterol, but what else is as changeable as quickly? Like his cholesterol dropped, what, 100 points in three days or five days? Mm -hmm. So it's not something like, well, get, you know, change your diet and then go get a checkup in six months. You could probably get a checkup six days later and some of these numbers will be very different. So it's not that we shouldn't ever test, but like we can't just totally hang our hat on these numbers. Yeah, you know, speaking of that too, uh, I think um, so folks kind of understand a little bit about it too. And if, if I, I believe when, when Dave got his, his last like, cholesterol test too, like if you would have looked at his cholesterol, his LDL cholesterol, um, when he had like the really good artery walls versus the regressing artery walls, his LDL cholesterol looked better during the regression phase than they did before that. So like... Um, I think that's just kind of pointing back to what you were saying earlier that, I mean, he's kind of rewriting what we can and cannot do with some of these numbers. So to me, it's like, it's one thing to go in and get this panel of reading saying, this is what's going on in your blood in this very moment. There's a whole nother thing to kind of put that into like a, a context of this is where they should be. Because really it seems like we know where your level should be if you're following a standard American diet. What we don't know is where your value should be when it's not your body's not being asked to you know function under that metabolic scenario and right it's some, something right. hopefully who knows and it might be something that's so complicated that it doesn't even 
it's not worth going into and we should just go back to like what you said, not looking at it much at all and just going by how you feel. Um, but if, the, if we were to go down that road, it's like we almost need to keep chugging away and find out, well, where are ideal parameters within the context of a ketogenic diet, within the context of a carnivore diet, in the context of a, a vegan, you know, and all these other areas and, you know, get a better look instead of kind of taking this one range uh, of standard American diet and saying everyone in here is healthy, everyone out is not. Yeah, I, I could not agree more. And like really, truly, I'm not trying to stroke your egos right now or anything, but one of the things that fascinates me most about the carnivore movement is that you are forcing us to ask new questions, even within the low carbon keto community, right? Where we already knew a lot of the conventional knowledge was garbage, you know, the cholesterol and saturated fat and blah, all of that was just nonsense anyway. But don't you need fiber for the gut biome? Don't you need curcumin? Don't you need resveratrol? Well, no, you obviously don't. And um, with, with regard to the reference ranges, like you were talking about, Zach, that's, it's almost scary to think how different some of what is quote unquote normal is for someone on a, car on a carnivorous diet or on a ketogenic diet as opposed to a 50 to 60% carbohydrate diet because some of those numbers, you know, obviously there's gonna be things like especially different electrolytes in the blood that you will die if your blood is completely out of whack with too high or too low on some of that. But some of these other metabolic markers, we don't know what they're supposed to look, you know, supposed to look like in somebody that isn't burning a ton of glucose all the time. Um, and I, I, one of the low carb physicians I know is <laughs> he mentioned that he might write a paper on the new normal. And, and we don't even know what the new normal is, but the fact is what we've considered normal for so long may not be, I don't want to use the word normal, but may not be appropriate for people on a carnivorous or ketogenic diet. Yeah, Amy, I'll just respond to that. And, uh, you know, what I, what I say is everything we know about modern medicine and our perception of health and perception of aging is predicated on our assumption that everybody was eating an agricultural, grain-based, 60% carbohydrate diet. So all of our medical knowledge, all of our interventions are based on that model. Again, whether that model is correct or not, you know, is debatable. Now, what I like to say is, you know, if your theory is a race car, right, and you think your race car runs really nice, well, drive it when you're driving around the track at 20 miles an hour, everything's smooth, the wheels aren't shaking. But if you start going 200 miles an hour, you might notice a shimmy here and there, something starts to break apart, some shakes. And that's what I consider the carnivore diet to be. You're testing that theory or whatever you think about nutrition at the, at the polar end. And once you get to the polar end, it's like some of those theories don't really hold up anymore because we're seeing things that are breaking apart. Again, you're to your point, do you need fiber? Do you need phytonutrients and antioxidants? And again, people can debate whether you know I and me in particular are healthy or not. I have my own particular bias, I believe I am, or the thousands of other people that are seemingly thriving. And certainly there's no I don't think at this point people can discount the fact that things like rheumatism, tort arthritis, or MS or these other diseases that require medications which are lifelong and progressive are, are going away, which is just shocking to me. And I think that's that needs to be further investigated very aggressively and hopefully we'll be able to do that. But I think again this is why it's so nice to have this outlier format is it's when you push the envelope to the edge, you see what shakes out and what's, what's, what doesn't. And, you know, one of the things I keep trying to get one of these damn competitive eaters on here because, you know, we, we, <laughs> uh, we might be able to get Furious Pete on. Maybe, maybe we can get him on there. But because uh, I know I've got Chris Bell is going to try to get me contacted with him. So, but, you know, and, and this would be interesting in the fact that, you know, there, these are people that eat, routinely eat 20 pounds of meat or whatever in one sitting. And what's going on physiologically? You know, what are they doing? You know, because, you know, there's satiety hormones. What allows you to, to crack the satiety code? How do I eat? You know, I'm full at four pounds. How do I eat the, the next 10 pounds? And what are the tricks they use? And they do that. And I think that will inform stuff about physiology just by looking at these people, too. So I think yeah. it's, it's really neat to study these kind of freaks because I think, you you know, you don't, it doesn't mean you necessarily need to emulate these people, but what can you learn from them? And I think that's really yeah. neat. Um, let's, I, do one, let, let's do one more topic, Amy, and then I think we should have you back on because there's so much stuff we can talk about. Oh, thanks. Can and, I, uh, if, if, if I can just take like real quick though, because you mentioned, I think you just mentioned MS because people have reported, I guess, that improving or going away on, on carnivore, you know, carnivore diet. I, I don't know this for certain, but based on what I've seen, I've only looked a little bit at Parkinson's disease, a little bit at MS and ALS, but... All of those neurodegenerative conditions, like to bring this back to Alzheimer's for a bit, all of those have in common reduced neuronal 
metabolism. They're all fuel crises to some extent. So I, I think, and again, I'm, I'm willing to be wrong and there's probably more to it, but I think at some level, it's actually the same underlying problem in all of these illnesses and the way it's manifesting in the body is different. You, they all have some type of neuronal fuel shortage. Some people are going to get MS. Some people are going to get Alzheimer's. Some people are going to get Parkinson's. Um, so it's it's fascinating because the more the more I read specifically about Parkinson's, also seems to be an insulin and glucose thing. And it's it's fascinating to think that. And 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 with the keto, you know, it reminds me of cancer in that the ketogenic diet is usually offered as a last resort when you have exhausted all the chemo and all the radiation and you've you've got one and a half feet in the grave well you might as well try that crazy ketogenic diet now because you're going to die anyway couldn't hurt to start eating egg yolks now it should be the first intervention now I, it recent research is showing that there may be some types of cancer that actually do worse on a ketogenic diet so you have to you know talk to your oncologist or talk to someone who's knowledgeable about this keto might not be suitable for all cancers but at least with regard to alzheimer's again this shouldn't be the last resort it should be the first line of intervention the minute you have a cognitive impairment boom ketogenic diet why should this be the last treatment after the disease is already so severe and advanced that no matter what you do you're probably not going to see any improvement yeah, Amy, I, and I talk, we talk about the IVR and stuff, and again, it's almost as if cancer is somehow verboten. You know, you're not allowed to talk about cancer and nutrition like it's, I, I mean, it's crazy to me. It's another disease like anything else is. But, you know, there's interesting, there's a guy right now on, the, on YouTube who has got Parkinson's disease. He's doing a carnivore diet, and he's documenting his progress. And, you know, he, I saw a video. He's nine days in. I'm not shaking as much. I can move and turn over in bed, which I couldn't do before. And so, again, we're seeing these people test the envelope. And again, does that? Can you extrapolate to the general population? Maybe, maybe not. We'll see. But I think it's nice to see people are are out there doing it. Let's talk about because because you know I know we've had some people on cholesterol. One of the things I've seen you talk about. I know there's a lot of topics. I know you've touched on because we're going to have Kelly Williams Hogan on next, and I don't know if you're familiar with her. She had, yeah, she's great. You know, <laughs> so we'll talk about her story, but but kind of to her to a little bit about her point. I know you've talked about and you've written about uh, kind of polycystic ovarian syndrome with women, and then the, then the equivalent. You know, you're calling PCOS of men. Can you go into those two things real real quick? Because I know there's a lot of women. Because we have you know some women that 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 you know I, I'm trying we're trying to broaden our broader our audience because we're bunch of meathead guys but we, we want to we want to bring these women in here and have them in there and have some topics that they might be interested in. but but again i think there's there's you know as much as there's pcos there, i think there really is a, a similar sort of condition that we see in men oh there is there is I, I wrote a blog post about that we can maybe put it in the notes or something but it's it's the male they call it the male phenotypic equivalent of pcos and you know, we know, we've known for a long time that PCOS is a hyperinsulinemic condition. Um, and again, there there might be some other factors in it, but the fact is when a lot of these women go on a low-carb or ketogenic or maybe a carnivorous diet, it basically completely goes away and they become fertile again, they start menstruating again, they conceive, it's all good. So in men, um, there's three things that seem to be spurred on by chronically high insulin, and it's erectile dysfunction, uh, prostate enlargement, BPH, benign prostate hypertrophy, and early onset baldness. So the men that have kind of losing their hair when they're younger, and that one, there's a there's slightly less evidence. There's a lot of sort of association between chronically high insulin and hair loss, but there seems to be a genetic component that if you have a genetic tendency toward baldness, the the in the hyperinsulinemia will will exacerbate that it will sort of trigger the hair loss rather than like if you have the hair loss gene but you're not hyperinsulinemic you won't lose your hair with the erectile dysfunction you know i'm sure ivor ivor knows this very well like erectile dysfunction isn't a libido problem it's not a desire problem it's not a sexual problem it's a cardiovascular problem it's a problem with um blood vessel dilation with blood flow to the penis and if you know blood flow to the penis because your blood vessels are glycated and hard as rocks and your your blood is thick like maple syrup because of all the sugar in it instead of flowing nicely like water well you're not going to be able to sustain an erection and there's you know other other factors with um insulin stimulating the sympathetic nervous system and if, if your sympathetic nervous system is going you're not gonna have an erection most likely and um and and the bph you know insulin is a growth promoting hormone um it's it's we can sort of think of it like an anabolic hormone we all know 
it promotes the growth of fat cells. What other cells does it promote the growth of? It's, you know, again, associated with skin tags, you know, aberrant, weird skin growth. Um, we need insulin for muscle. And I, I just heard your interview with Stu Phillips. So it, it, he said insulin is permissive. You don't need a huge spike, but you do need the presence of insulin to build and maintain muscle. Um, and, and insulin is going to affect aberrant excess growth elsewhere, including the prostate gland. I am... I don't know how Ivor is going to take that. The implication that he has got personal uh, knowledge with it works out as fine. Does he shave? Maybe he shaves his head. I don't know if he's bald by 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 choice. Well, you know, or it's by kind of like, I, you know, unfortunately, I don't have all my. I lost started losing my hair in my thirties, and it's probably because I was eating a damn rat, crap, crap. If I'd have been a carnivore diet back then, I probably had hair like Zach. But <laughs> but anyway, yeah. But I, I think that I mean I think that's very important to to talk about. And you know, I, I agree with you what you say. I think it, I think you do. You see the the classic overweight bald guy with glasses uh, that. You know, probably has erectile dysfunction. I think there is a phenotype, just like you see with the sort of obese, hair suit, you know, lethargic PCOS person. You know, and I right. think that, uh, you know, I I think just again, you know, you you can and, and people will often say you can't look at somebody and say if they're healthy or not. I'm like, you kind of can. You can kind of yeah, look at somebody and say, look, that person probably has this and that and this and that, and more often than not, they'll have at least some of that going on. In, in some ways you can, but also like, cause we, you know, we were talking about weight before, not everybody with BPH or with erectile dysfunction is going to be overweight. Now they, when you look at body composition more so than weight or BMI, they probably are what we call over fat. They have a high body fat percentage, so they may not look obese, but they're very fat compared to the amount of muscle mass. And then just to, um, to clarify real quick on the male version of PCOS, it's it's not just that there's these other metabolic things driven by chronically high insulin in men. Some of the actual hormonal changes that we see in women with PCOS are the same in men, whether it's the effect on like luteinizing hormone, follicle stimulating hormone, sex hormone, b binding globulin, all those other hormones. The What we see in women, it's the same thing in men. And of course, men don't have ovaries, so it just manifests in other ways in the male body. Perfect. Perfect. Well, Amy, that was wonderful. Um, Zach, anything else? I, I know, uh, like I said, I, I hope we can get you back on maybe, you know, six months down the road, you know, as our, as we start running out of guests and we'll start hitting the, you know, hopefully not, but I mean, you no, know, we're trying to con continue to eat interesting people because I, like, I know you're well-spoken and well-read and, well, and you well, you're well-written on uh, just a whole bunch of topics, which I think are germane to what this audience wants to listen, listen to. And, uh, uh, it's, it's great talk, you know, again, meeting you virtually, hopefully, like I said, in person as I, yeah. as I hopefully will start to maybe get out of my little internet shell and, and, and go see real humans more. Uh, hopefully I'll run into you at some of these conferences or other places and hopefully, you know, we can all kind of collaborate and, uh, you know, make a difference. And I think that's, you know, I think that's ultimately what, you know, provides, you know, I, I, I do it in a selfish fashion because it just makes me happy to see other people get, get healthier. And, I, and mm -hmm. you know, I, you know, you, you kind of try to be totally altruistic, but honestly, some of it's for my own benefit just because it makes me feel like I'm doing good. But uh, yeah. And I think you're doing great, Amy. Appreciate it. Oh, thank you so much. And thanks for having me on. I am definitely not a human performance outlier, Zach. I just want to say <laughs> I've, I've completed two marathons and I, I had to drag myself across the finish line of both. And it was over five hours, so I'm slow as a turtle. And, and I was chubby at the finish line of both, but that was pre-low carb. So that just goes to show, like Tim Noakes says, you can't outrun a bad diet. <laughs> well, well, that's two. That's two more marathons that I've run, Amy. So you got me beat there. So <laughs> and we, I don't miss it. I don't miss it. I'm not doing it again. <laughs> We've talked about that too. Is like, well, what is a performance outlier? And uh, I think what Sean and I have come to is it's someone who is going outside the norm to do something that is good or impressive or extraordinary. And I think you definitely fit that window with what you've been putting and putting out in terms of information and. Uh, I have no doubt when we have you back on, we can fill another hour plus with quality content. So thanks a bunch for coming on. Um, if you want to share with the uh, listeners like where they can find you, where you like to kind of hang out on the interwebs, that'd be awesome too. Yeah, my book is called The Alzheimer's Antidote. You can get that on Amazon. Uh, I'm very active on Twitter. My handle is Tuit Nutrition, T-U-I-T Nutrition, and my website is tuitnutrition.com. Awesome. We'll be sure to link that stuff to the show notes as well so the listeners can easily click through it. But uh, thanks again for coming on, Amy. Great. Thanks a lot. Take care, guys.